This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on-chain or a business looking to white-label the stack, visit GnosisPay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low-cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM-compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I'm Felix, and I'm here with Meher. Today, we're speaking with Iliad, who is the co-founder of NIR and CEO of the NIR Foundation. NIR is a sharded layer one blockchain. So welcome, welcome, Ilya. Welcome back on Epicenter. It's great to have you for a second time. Yeah, thanks for having me. And congrats on, uh, yeah, 10 years. Epic, epic uh, achievement in this space. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, like you said, it's it's basically 70 years in crypto. So we've we've all aged a bit. Yesterday in the episode, we recorded <laughs> yesterday, the 10 years episode, they had like the slideshow and you could see the progression of Meher, <laughs> Brian and... Sebastian, uh, like from their youth to their forties or <laughs> late thirties. So yeah, that's great. Um, cool. Yeah. We actually wanted to start unconventionally, um, with your background. Um, but in, in your case, it's a very interesting background in AI and machine learning. So, um, we wanted to first sort of talk about your work there. Uh, you're one of the authors of the original transformers paper. Um, can you, yeah, maybe start by like telling us about your start in the AI and the ML space? For sure. Yeah. I mean, so I started tinkering with AI, I think even in high school, uh, I was actually excited about neural networks as a concept and, uh, I worked for a machine learning company that was a pretty old school machine learning company, uh, starting from first year of college. But when I saw kind of deep learning resurfacing in 2012, 13, there was this kind of seminal work at a time, which uh, now, now feels like da, but back then was very exciting, which was uh, they trained in neural network to encode and like encode the image and then decode it back into the same image. So pre-training, what we know now as uh, and that model without any supervision learned to detect cats. And so there was a neuron in the network, which if you activate it, it would, it would generate a cat and like different types of cats. And so it learned something like semantic without any training, like in any like input data from humans, right? Just by looking at images. And so when I saw that, and that was done by Google, by Jeff Dean and Andrew Yang, and they did it on a bunch of GPUs and, uh, like they, they managed to scale it up and I'm like, I want to do that. <laughs> I think that's, that's the thing that's, that's gonna, you know, actually change things. And so I joined Google research. Uh, my belief always was that natural language, not images going to be the driver for reasoning and for 
uh, kind of like intelligence because, you know, there's many, many species in the world, like hundreds of thousands of species that see and only one species that talks and has language, right? So there's way more semantic information in language. And so my team worked across a variety of things, uh, specifically uh, question answering. So when you like type uh, questions on google.com, we were actually running a neural networks to try to read our like uh, pages that you see and respond to you with like a short answer. So like you would see sometimes short answers. Now, the challenge was the neural networks at the time, specifically recurrent neural networks, were too slow to be put in production. And so we were just using bag of words models, which means you literally throw all the words without any order into the model, and it kind of tries to figure out what's going on. And it, wor it worked reasonably well. But, uh, and this is where kind of... Uh, the transformers gave birth was like we could not use RNN in any practical use case and so uh, we were looking kind of for something and so Jakob who was the manager and had like another team uh, came up with this idea like they were using attention on top of words without any recurrence for, for another task and so kind of merging that idea with recurrence like can we use attention to somehow uh, figure out which words are relevant in the order when you do answer questions or translate something. And that kind of gave birth to the Transformers. It really was like, we need something that's really performant, that can be highly parallelized, and attention is a really good mechanism, you know, logically to do this. But if you package it all, kind of the way these models really work is that everything happens in parallel. Like the way I like to describe it, there's this movie Arrival, where aliens talk in the whole sentence at the same time. Like there's like a circle of scribblies, but they produce it at the same time. And that's kind of how Transformers actually read articles. It's not like one word at a time. It's literally reads the whole article, all the words in parallel, and then like has multiple steps to kind of process it and reconcile this, like the understanding of it. And then it answers the question. And so, so that lays out really well for the modern hardware GPUs that we use. And so it allows to have like this massive kind of performance improvement, which means also you can scale up the models. And so I uh, was, a, you know, worked on that with a team of amazing researchers, uh, which now all went to do really cool stuff. Uh, and then at the time I decided to leave Google to start an AI company near AI, which was supposed to be pretty much teaching machines to code. So my belief, and I still believe this, that now given this, these types of models, you can change how we interact with computing. You can actually talk to computers and they do work for you instead of needing to have an engineer to write code for you, right? Which again, like now it seems more obvious that that's possible. Back in 2017, that was like, huh? Uh, and so, so we started near AI, but we only we gave us a year because obviously it, at that time it was a moonshot, and we didn't have that much resources. So we we're doing some interesting stuff uh, around data collection and some machine learning stuff. But one thing we ended up doing is getting a lot of people around the world actually doing uh, like writing some code for us, writing some descriptions for the code. And so we, we had to struggle to pay them because they were mostly students in China and Ukraine and Russia in kind of some other countries. And like some of them don't have bank accounts. Some like Ukraine, for example, PayPal doesn't work. In China, PayPal doesn't work. Um, and so there was like no good way to do it like programmatically uh, to send people money. And so we started looking at blockchain as like, hey, can we just send people money easily? <laughs> Yeah, in, in code. And the answer was in 2018, the answer was actually no, because even back then the fees on Bitcoin and Ethereum were way too high. Uh, and, and then as you probably know, when you start on the blockchain rabbit hole, you cannot stop. You just keep digging and you're like, wait, what is this? <laughs> and so, uh, so we kind of, as we keep digging and researching different blockchains and different technologies, we're like, wait, we actually know how to build um, something of this sort, right? So my co-founder, Alex, he was building Sharded Database Company before. Um, and we have like, you know, systems background. We're like, 
we can probably do this, but we can focus on user experience, developer experience, while kind of solving the scalability underneath and making sure fees are uh, staying stable. And so that's kind of how we went from near AI to becoming a near protocol in 2018 and, and starting this journey. So Ilya, um, in this current wave of LLMs, uh, of course, like this attention mechanism is a key part, but another key part is just the idea of, you know, like just the idea of scale, right? Like collect a, a lot of data from the internet, from books, and then pre-train the model. And of course, the ideas of RLHF and all, they came later, but the fundamental idea is you throw in a lot of data, you pre-train, you make a big model, sort of produce good results. Did you anticipate that scale was going to work this well? And if so, why would, did you use that approach in, in near AI? No, I, I, that, that's a part that definitely kind of was interesting to see uh, that as people scaled up the models, they became like they started exhibiting kind of properties, like more and more sophisticated reasoning properties. And it's like, it makes sense now that, you know, you think about it, like the capacity of the model is higher. It's able to like generalize better. It's able to kind of learn quote unquote programs um, that it can execute. But yeah, at the time that wasn't like particularly clear. Uh, that like it will be that kind of step function change. And so we, yeah, we were not at near AI, we were not doing that partially because we also just didn't have, uh, you know, like we raised, you know, small seed, like pre-seed round actually. And, uh, we, we thought we could get better, uh, supervised data instead. Um, and we did, we did some pre-training on like GitHub and, and things like that, but we, we didn't thought, didn't think of like train on the whole internet, uh, at like large scale. And we did have resources to do something like that either. And the other interesting thing is kind of like this, this attention mechanism also seems to like it's built for natural language processing, but also seems to kind of work across different modalities, like such as like images and maybe video in the future. And like, how does that come across to you? Right? Like, is that unexpected or is that, is that something you expected in the past? I mean, like when the transformers were just in development, there was like, like the teams actually tried them on different modalities. I mean, not like multi-model models, but different modalities. And it was pretty interesting to see it worked really well. Um, so I think it's, it, that was kind of known that it works on, on different modalities pretty early on. I think the kind of the intuition there is really that, you know, the way kind of we work as well is very much like, like our, our eyes actually like move all the time, every like, I, I forgot how many milliseconds. And so we actually kind of pay attention to different parts and then our brain kind of reconstructs the image, right, at different levels. Um, and kind of, you know, with natural language, same, right? You read sentences, you like build some semantic meaning and then, you know, you kind of continue building out this the meaning of the what you read. Um, but sometimes you like zoom in on specific words when you need to uh, answer a question. And so like, I think like generally speaking, there is like intuition behind this, but obviously again, it's like, it, it's interesting to see how well it all works, right? I definitely, you know, um, like we had, we had a pretty good models, like even before it, it just like, they were super slow and like none, you couldn't use them in production at all. But this, you know, obviously like the, the scale with which, for example, open AI went and, and scaled it up. And, and by the way, they did a tremendous amount of work to make it work. Like it's not, we cannot take it for granted. They're just like, oh, we just increased parameters and hit enter. Like, no, it was a ton of work, um, across the board from, you know, low level engineering to like fine tuning to, you know, they changed some of the model, uh, kind of details of model architecture as well. Um, but yeah, like the, it's, it is, it is, it was surprising for me. Like, I think like the, when it went from two to three, that was like interesting. Uh, like two, it was kind of like, okay, yeah, I get it. Like we've, we've trained models like that at Google kind of thing. 
Um, from two to three, it was like, okay, that's that's really interesting because I can see um, the you know there's like something more now happens, and obviously three point five is where like okay, yeah, that's like it actually learned something that is like beyond uh, just language modeling, right? Like there's some reasoning that is is extractable now through kind of this instruction fine tuning. On a high level, I'm I'm actually curious what your stances on this stochastic parrot versus understanding spectrum. So, so there are um, there are people in the AI community that let's say that LLMs actually don't understand anything. They are stochastic parrots in the sense that they have understood the statistics of what word follows what other word in language because they have seen billions of examples. And when you talk to an LLM and it's generating words, it's just uh, replicating the statistics of what it has seen in the past without actual any understanding behind behind the box. That's the, uh, like, at the extreme, that's the stochastic parrot view. And on the other extreme, perhaps there's a view uh, maybe like the Ilya Satskever view, which is kind of when you force a model to predict the next word uh, and you force it to do it again and again, in order to predict the next word, it has to start learning something about the world itself to do the, the job of prediction well. And in kind of trying to predict it well, it is forced to learn about the world. And so it has actual, actual intelligence about what world it has in, it is in. So it's not just a uh, stochastic parrot. This is actually, when you're talking to GPT-4, you're talking to something which has understanding distilled into it. And there seem to be like these two extremes in the in the space. And I'm, I'm curious like where you stand on on that uh, on that debate. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm I definitely closer to Scaver's view. I, like from my perspective, kind of, you know, it at the end is a bunch of math, right? And so, like, you can kind of decompose what this math is doing and, you know, try to build an intuition around, like, types of transformations it can it can and cannot do. And so, from my perspective, kind of, you know, the first step is you take the document and you embed it, right? So, you went from words into a multi into dots in multidimensional space. Right, so I mean, let's let's for a second imagine it's two-dimensional, although it's multiple, and so there is like kind of the words that are similar, right, are you know close to in the space the words that are far. Now you have a next layer which transforms these words, right, to kind of give them more context, uh, and so this you know think of it as rotation in the space, and then you have a tension which is you know you're trying to kind of given the the current word you know try to pull in the context of the words around it to give to give it more semantic meaning. And so that's another transformation, right? So like in a way you take kind of set of words, right? And then you kind of keep transforming them. Uh, and so it, it what it learns is this transformation function, which in a way is a program. It's a program that is trying to transform the words into a level which is useful then to predict next word. Right or and then like later respond to questions, and so kind of is this like a pure stochastic parrot where it's like, well, pure stochastic parrot we had when we were doing just like you know we we were generating Wikipedia articles for example right you just give it a name and just say generate a Wikipedia article like that's pure like you know there there's it just makes up stuff because like that that name doesn't exist right there's no <laughs> there's nothing so it just generates something that looks like an article. But when we when we starting to look at like okay well how would you answer to this question right it it to be able to do that right it needs to kind of process the information right it it does this kind of transformations on the on the article and like it's trying to connect contextualize that and and give give the answer so in a way like I think of it as it learns some set of programs that like our world has, right? So like, it's not a complete world model, right? It clearly has a lot of gaps, but it is a kind of set of programs that our like world model has that it can apply to be able to 
uh, to answer well or predict next word for a training. And that on itself is really useful, right? As we see, but it's also because it has so many gaps, it, it, it has issues with doing some, you know, kind of specific things. And the more precise it needs to be, the less well it does, right? Because it kind of ends up being like, if either the, prog the, pro the programs are very probabilistic and kind of semantic versus, you know, if you ask it to like describe the steps of, of something. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of the things we do is kind of like, there's like few thing, core things and then everything else you kind of fill in automatically, right? So that's why it's really good. Like even at coding, like most of the, most of the coding we do, right, is actually kind of boilerplate-y. And so, and so with like few nudges, you can actually get to like a reasonable code. Uh, and that's why I think like things like co-pilots are, are in kind of pretty good products in result. Cool. So like, turning to applicative view. So now this LLMs are, are pretty amazing and you have some applicative ideas on applying them to the near ecosystem. So yeah, w what, what are they and how do you see that unfold? Yeah, I think I think of this kind of a, a, across three dimensions. So the first dimension is actually less about AI itself and more about our kind of society. And this is the idea that kind of as more content is generated, as there's more kind of information wars in general, misinformation. And again, the important part to note: misinformation is not an AI problem; it's a human problem. The it you know, we are in crypto space and so Byzantine generals is something that our space is based on. And li that's literally the, you know, the mis <laughs> citable misinformation. Um, like, and so, so the idea of like misinformation of, of malicious like attack on information is something that exists from, you know, uh, from like uh, early on. And so from my perspective, the way to kind of start solving that is to to bring the kind of security, cryptography, and reputation to a level of um, of the content of the of individual pieces of content. So right now, for example, we are you know using websites. We have HTTPS, and so we have a, we have a some set of security guarantees around accessing specific websites. But the content on the website can be coming from anywhere. It can be saying anything. And there's no way to kind of maintain reputation, context, comments, etc. around it. So we need a new set of standards around that so that you can hover an image and it shows you or a video or a piece of text. And it tells you like who published it, when it was done, if there's any side comments or context, etc. from reputable sources that should be attached to it. So for that, we need blockchain. We need, you know, set of standards. We need browser support and we need kind of publishers to be supporting this. Uh, and I think that's a really important part for our society generally because otherwise we're going to be living in a world of kind of, you know, all the content is like you never know what if it's true or not, right? And it's constantly like um, kind of manipulation around that. Now, kind of the second pillar for me is I call it kind of decentralized AGI, right? So if we assume, you know, these models are getting more powerful, more intelligent, uh, what you definitely don't want is a single company or, you know, two or three companies deciding what's right and wrong for these models to do. You don't want the, like them to decide what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do with models. It's also, like, it's the same thing that happened with social networks. Like, being a kind of, moral police for the world just doesn't work. The world is very multidimensional. Something that's legal in Amsterdam is completely legal in a lot of other countries and the other way around. And so like, and, you know, what moral is is even more complicated. And so it's really important to have community be governing kind of the uh, alignment, safety, as well as kind of the, you know, instruction data sets uh, that these models are trained on. And as well as like being able to validate that the model you run is actually the model uh, that you wanted to run, right? So right now, if you call, you know, GPT API or Google API, 
you get a response, you have no idea who, which, like, who produced that response. You have no guarantees that it was the model that you uh, wanted to run. And actually, sometimes it's not because you're trying to optimize costs. And so, uh, like, how do you actually have those guarantees? And especially for something that's mission critical, right? Like, like if I'm doing trading on this, if I'm doing healthcare, like uh, any kind of business decisions, right? You want to make sure to, you know, you're accessing the model that you have predictable parameters and outputs. And so for that, we need decentralized inference. We need kind of model marketplaces. We need kind of uh, community data, crowdsourcing and data management, uh, governance. And so kind of the whole stack of tooling that really manages this and then you know, on top of this, you'll be able to to kind of interact with it in a hopeful, like I think the other way is like making sure it's privacy preserving so that when you interact with it, you have it. So there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of, like there's a bunch of startups doing decentralized inference. There is still privacy gap. I think that people are researching, but it's still pretty far. Um, there's some data marketplaces, there's some other kind of pieces, but it's not really, I would say like combined into like a product story yet. But I think like that's a really important for like humanity period because otherwise, you know, like tomorrow you go to your favorite, uh, mo you know, AI model and it says like, oh, you banned or, you know, you use the incorrect word and so now <laughs> or something, right? Uh, so all, all the usual stuff we've seen before. And then finally, I actually think the... The flip side of this is local models, right? Because although like these big models, they have the world knowledge, they have maybe access to lots and lots of context, uh, but actually what you want most of the time is a model that knows everything about you, but you don't want all this data to go anywhere else, right? You want it to live with you on your machine, on your, um, you know, your private encrypted data store. And you want a model that's able to access that. So you want a local model that is personalized for you. You control it. It's not affected and manipulated in any way by, you know, advertisement giants. And so it's actually on your side and is just responding kind of the way you would like to, not the way, you know, uh, Tide wants you or whatever. And so I think that is a really important side of kind of as well. And so we actually been uh, playing around with like edge intelligence and uh, did a couple events and been kind of talking with some projects um, around this space. And it's like, it's actually, it's less web three, like in the sense of blockchain, but it's more web three in the sense of principles, right? It's user owned AI It's you know, controlling your own data. It's like all of those values that we talk about. And I think that and kind of the Web3 self custody will be converging more kind of in a, in, in a, on the principal side, right? Maybe and like on technology side as well. And this is kind of the area I'm, I'm most excited and working on right now. So in practice, how, how are you like approaching this? Are there like teams you are funding or is like there an AI team in year or how, how can we imagine this? Yeah, so we've been working with some AI teams. We actually just had a Neocon uh, about a month ago and we had an AI track there with some projects presenting that we're already working with, uh, as well as uh, kind of, I'm working as like advisor with a few projects um, kind of more closely. And uh, we do have, I would say like AI efforts more on also just automating our own operations. Like, th so the other side of this is I think Kind of the ecosystem itself should become AI enabled, and over time, AI ran. So, like, ideally, my you know my job and uh, kind of the job of coordinating the ecosystem should be done by AI. And by the way, the AI is a kind of like this approach actually solved the core problem of humanity and of resource coordination. The core problem of humanity is principal agent problem. Is that when we want somebody to 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 do stuff on our behalf, like we select, you know, uh, in elections or we hire someone to manage our money or something else, they have their own needs and, and they have their own wants. And so their decisions are usually not fully aligned with us who hired them. So that's called principal agent problem. And so AI actually being the agent that 
behaves on our behalf, acts on our behalf, is the way to solve that. And if you scale it up to kind of governance level, right, like actually having AI being the actor that, uh, you know, makes decisions based on what the population wants is the way to solve a lot of the current challenges with, you know, when you elect someone that they did do stupid things, right, or not things that they promised to do, kind of that's a way to like really address it. And so there's a really interesting kind of future of governance there. But like we can start applying it now in this decentralized ecosystems because they're already fully digital. They already have kind of like all the actions are on chain, right? So you can have traceability, you can have like veto power, et cetera, if something goes wrong. And so I'm really excited about also that side of the um, applying AI in, in Web3 space. And obviously you need that whole AI general, like decentralized stack to do that. But we are kind of starting to do it from bottom up on, on our side, just in foundation, for example, like, hey, what are things we can automate? What are things that we can like start leveraging this technology for? As well as maybe build some of the tooling for developers to build kind of AI enabled things in, in, in the space. We also have, yeah, like a bunch of projects that are kind of experimenting with this across different uh, areas. Yeah, that's super awesome. I, I also saw actually your co-founder, like the Alex, working directly on like smarter LLMs. Can you maybe also like, what, what's that about? Is that related to Nier or is it like some sort of totally different thing? Or what, what can you share about that? Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's a stealth project right now. So I'll, I'll not go into too detail. Maybe you'll have him, uh, you know, in, a, in, in at some point <laughs> to go more in depth into it. But yeah, I mean, it, we kind of, uh, so I'm advisors there and we work in kind of, uh, I would say side by side, but yeah, he's focusing more on the lower level and like kind of preparing for the future of, of this as well. Yeah, I think, um, I guess maybe you, you're mentioning, right? Like AI sort of also like making our life easier in the sense of operationally in the organizations, but also I guess, yeah, in wider society and I guess that's always been like a huge focus of Nier. So, um, yeah, we wanted to sort of yeah, dive also in that side of Nier where um, basically you're branded now in many places like as the blockchain operating system. And I think, yeah, one of the core features around that is like sort of the, the UX focus of Nier. So maybe, um, yeah, can you explain to us how Nier has sort of approached um, yeah, basically usability for, for developers and, and users on, in, the, in blockchain systems and, and what you're currently doing there? For sure, yeah. So, I mean, this was our vision from the start because when we started ourselves kind of diving into the blockchain, and again, this is 2018, so things were different. Uh, you know, you needed to install Mist for the... <laughs> um, and so, the, I mean, the experience was pretty, like, painful. And, and it's also... It was built on top of kind of a very different set of primitives, I would say, like conceptual primitives that, than what normally people, both users and developer expect, right? So, you know, you need like to understand the zero X wallets, you need a seed phrase, you need to like kind of pay gas, you need to like kind of do all these things which are like strange uh, when you, you know, when you're just starting and what we've tried to do from the start is like, how do we design kind of still like a blockchain that is secure, that it has all all the same properties that we all want, um, but is able to kind of hide a lot of this complexity, uh, ideally most of it and make, you know, blockchain kind of abstracted out such that developers, when they build applications, can just build like as close to normal Web2 experience, but using the benefits of Web3, using the kind of all of the value, and then also enabling users to have like more composability, right? More ownership, kind of being able to interact with multiple kind of applications and, and uh, have this like transportability of data. And so the near itself, right? kind of was designed with this. So we've, like our accounts, for example, you know, the account abstraction part of the accounts have been designed from scratch, from the start on the protocol level. Uh, there's like a bunch of kind of differences that uh, we've done, including that accounts themselves are, you know, just a username uh, that follows kind of the main name structure. 
We have lots of different keys with different permissions, which allow us to have like multiple devices securely. It allows to delegate uh, access. It allows to like applicate the front end of application to have a session key, for example, to transact uh, for a specific set of uh, kind of interactions. So kind of all of this functionality comes in by default. And then uh, on the developer side, the choices we made are around, first of all, choosing WebAssembly, which at this point is like, seems that everybody's kind of agrees on, uh, but um, pretty much it's like, it's an engine that runs in all the browsers. It's something that, uh, you know, is like on billions of devices at this point. It's supported by, you know, large network of uh, kind of developers. It runs on edge. It, you know, it supports lots of languages. You can run a lot of uh, software in it. And so, uh, so we kind of picked that and made it really easy to build, like in a way from a developer perspective, what, when you write near a smart contract, it's really just a service which has message, like messages in and out. And you have a kind of local key value database, which is pretty much like the limits there are so big that like, I don't think anybody ever hits them. Like you can, you, I think we have contracts that have like four gigabytes of storage in their, uh, in their database, right? Um, so you can build like massive, massive contracts. Specifically, you can build other chains as a smart contract on near. So we have Aurora, which is an EVM as a smart contract, just like take in, you know, the EVM that's usually run people as a separate chain, just put a smart contract Their Their database is where all the state of the, uh, of the stored, right? You can do the same with Bitcoin. I've, I've been suggesting somebody to like fork Bitcoin and put it on there, make it ultrasound money. Um, um, we have JavaScript running as well. So you can run JavaScript smart contracts. You can potentially do Python and other stuff. So like it kind of enables developer experience across the board. And since then we kind of following the same principle as like, okay, well, now that you can build anything on smart contract side, what's the next next part? Well. Actually, you want to get the data out of this, um, out of the blockchain. And blockchains are not optimized for reading data. They are op kind of, we tend to optimize them for writing and kind of maintaining security. And so for reading data, you want a completely different data structure. And so that, hence, there's like this principle of indexing and um, kind of in the way of chain computation. And so, so we've been building indexing framework and that actually culminated in what we call query API which is a service that indexes, that you can like write a smart contract that describes the indexing of data that executes off-chain. So in a way, it's like an off-chain computation framework uh, that allows you to store output of that computation in kind of SQL databases that then you can query. And finally, well, okay, now you have backend and, and middleware. Now you need a front end, right? And again, it seems weird that we are like, oh, you build everything decentralized, but now run a server on a specific domain that you will need to maintain. It's like, okay, well, that kind of violates the whole part point <laughs> of what we're doing. So, so we created this uh, kind of decentralized front end framework that allows to store the front end code itself on chain. So again, the smart contracts code on chain, the middleware code on chain, the front end code on chain, and now anyone, any kind of, we call them gateways, can render this code on the user side, right? So we have a desktop app, we can have a mobile app, and we have obviously web apps that can load that from the blockchain directly in your browser and render it there. So there's no kind of middle server that's needed uh, to render. You, you don't need to have a domain. You can, obviously, if you want to. And so you can just, you know, launch, a web, launch kind of part of your web app as as this decentralized front-end component, and now it will live forever on blockchain, right by, side by side with your smart contracts, have the same upgradability, have security, cryptographic security, who has it, have versioning. So if I, as a user, don't hate a new version, I can go to version before. And so like all of the same properties we really like about smart contracts, we now get for front-ends. So, so all of that is really enables like a full stack decentralized development that is you know, familiar with to normal developers, it's React JavaScript components, it's JavaScript for middleware indexing, it's JavaScript, Rust, C++, and like other languages for smart contracts. So you have like a full stack decentralization that you can have. 
And interestingly, as we were building the front ends, we realized actually the front ends can work with any blockchain. And so uh, we kind of just turned on all the EVMs and some other uh, blockchains. And people started building all the EVM front ends as well. So we have a Uniswap, for example, for Linea, the, the kind of official Uniswap front end is served out of the decentralized front end, right? Because by the way, it also doesn't charge extra fees. And we have like partnerships with others, ZKVM, Mantle, et cetera. And so the idea is like, actually, as you start looking from that lens, from a user lens, right? As a user, I don't really care which blockchain the apps is on. I just want to use them. And like, if you go to, you know, some like, you know, some of this uh, gateways where you can access this front ends, you can just go and search for whatever app you want, click on it and start using it. That, that's how it should be. And so, uh, and this is kind of where we get to this concept I started with, which is like, hey, we want to abstract the blockchain for users and developers. We're getting back to it with kind of this, now that we have this full stack decentralization, we're like, actually, this works for all blockchains for all chains, for rollups, for whatever, uh, because you can actually abstract out all that on the front end side and make it really easy for people to interact with it. And so, hence, we kind of started going backwards now with some of the other launches we had, right? N allowing pretty much as a kind of, how do we make it really easy now for one experience to, to unite all of the blockchains and kind of, we call it chain abstraction principle. And so this goes into like DA and and some other things we yeah we can discuss. So so India is it is it correct to imagine um, so when you talk of like this indexer service or the service of hosting a front end, is it correct to imagine it as the indexing logic or the front end logic is stored on the chain, but then there is some kind of off, off chain actor. That is actually taking that um, taking that logic or and the data, and actually serving it much as a traditional server, and somehow the chain is guaranteeing that this server's work is correct, and it is compensated. Is it is it correct to imagine it like that? Yeah, pretty much. So the idea is, I mean, similar to maybe blockchain validator nodes as well, right? There's a kind of a logic. <laughs> that is conceptual and that all the validators are doing that job. Um, and like, you can always have, you know, more validators, less validators. It's kind of uh, independent of that. Similarly, yes, the indexing logic and the front end kind of source code itself is stored on chain. And so any server can run on and kind of create the same, you know, outcome from this, right? Again, similar to RPCs, for example, RPC server, right? is serving your data, but it's, uh, uh, you know, anybody can run an RPC server and get the same results. So like it's it's part of protocol in a way, uh, it becomes part of protocol. And so a similar thing we're trying to do for both front ends and middleware indexing as well. So maybe one way to think about this is that, so on, on, on Ethereum, like if you look at Ethereum, um, there's a base layer blockchain and then there are separate protocols like the ENS for naming your blockchain address to a human readable name. There is the graph, which kind of like indexes a smart contract and kind of presents historical data about the transactions and events in the smart contract. Um, and maybe maybe there are other examples that I'm missing. So in Ethereum, like, these are like different systems and usually they are competing systems. There's ENS, but they might be a competitor to ENS. The graph, and they might be a competitor to the graph. But in near... Nia has kind of taken the philosophy that some of some of these things are like uh, are like really key to the UX of a blockchain, and therefore they should be supported out of the box by the layer one itself. Is that is that the philosophy here? To an extent, yeah. I think I think the way to think about it is it's more than just layer one, right? Like at the end, when we are interacting with applications on any of these chains, um, like there's a whole host of tools and, and more importantly, standards that we are interacting with, right? And so like ERC-20, for example, is a standard. And it's a standard that kind of came out of the application space, but it's now like, you cannot imagine a CDO without ERC-20 standard. 
And so what we're doing here is really defining standards for this key primitives that are just going beyond just, you know, token transfers, but going to like how to how to define indexing, how to define decentralized runners. Now, implementation of those things can like you can have many implementations. You can have, you know, mobile render and web render, you can have indexing, like you can have, you know, external partners who are competing with each other, how to implement it. Uh, same same for RPCs, right? RPC is a standard, but then the way it's implemented, right, can be very different. Like underneath, you maybe like cached everything in database, it may be using Cloudflare, like whatever the architecture you want to use. But the standard is there. And I think what we've been trying to do is define a standard and, I mean, have a reference implementation, but for for this more key pieces to make, indeed, the experience more aligned and kind of have this, like, singular journey for developers and users that, you know, is cohesive. And, yeah, like, the way, you know, some of the things, like, you can have businesses around the standards that are, you know, very profitable, um, but, like, the, the core principle for me of decentralization is actually in the standard. It's the fact that, like, if you define a standard, it means that you can swap in and swap out any participant. And so you're not, you don't have this, like, lock-in effect. You don't have the effect of, you know, you go to a bank and you cannot move your money out because it doesn't allow you to. Or, you know, the cannot cancel your telco provider. because like, Or, like, your positive telco providers don't even work for you. The Here we can always have, like, a competitor that comes in and if they're more effective and can provide better prices, people can switch to it. But the stand because the standards is the same. And so for me, that's kind of the key principle of like web three in general. And so I think the challenge that I've seen is like not having the standards actually leads to kind of huge fragmentation of experiences and as well, like actually mon- mon- monopoly has been built because like now that you built all your software towards some API, you cannot switch because nobody else provides this and like you need to rewrite half of your code to do that. So how much is kind of an an analogy with the Apple ecosystem versus the Microsoft ecosystem for desktop? How much, how well does it map? So in a sense, when you look at kind of like the, the Apple, uh, the Apple ecosystem, it's a company that has kind of maintained control over its kind of like operating system supply chain, its way of like delivering music, its way of delivering books, uh, its way of how kind of um, applications kind of like appear to the end user. Um, and in the in the beginning, I think they also wanted control over the hardware, but maybe they have retracted on that now. Whereas like kind of like Microsoft is one where just like the raw operating system and then applications emerge. And if there are standards needed for their interoperability, the market kind of like figures it out. And from the outside, it feels like, okay, Near is kind of like more going towards that Apple philosophy that we are going to define all of the standards for for many of the things that are key determinants of the user experience. Uh, Whereas other ecosystems like Cosmos or Ethereum might be more kind of like the Microsoft approach where we are providing like transaction throughput as the center, the account model as the center, and then kind of a lot of the interoperability between the standards is left to the market to figure out. How, how much does that analogy map and how much does, doesn't it map? I mean, the I would say the part that like agree on is we're definitely trying to focus on user experience right and so with that it's it's important to figure out like what are the touch points that you want to have standards on again like my perspective is for example rpc json rpc is part of ethereum standard like it's part of kind of the protocol even though it's actually not but like it it by all accounts if you try to change that rpc api like you will break everyone and so, so we kind of see in a similar way, right? Like if RPC is part of the standard, why not some other parts? But as I said, like, you know, Near, for example, has like number of contributors that are building things. Like the, the actually the VM that's built right now for the decentralized front ends is built by proximity, right? Uh, and uh, for example, you know, the query API kind of, other companies can implement the same standard and provide kind of better services. So I think the idea here is that by defining the standard, we're kind of actually opening up the market for people to fill in like with better products 
uh, in this. And again, like it's pretty early still. So like a lot of stuff, we still build like reference implementations, but similar as Ethereum by defining a standard for protocol, it opened up a place for all of these clients to be implemented, right? Like that's kind of the idea is like you, you, you define a standard and then you open it up so that uh, others can contribute to it in the same way versus competing on APIs and competing on like kind of, uh, you know, in the way marketing uh, what's happening right now in, in, uh, in like token price, <laughs> what's happening in Ethereum for some of this like infrastructure tooling, right? Uh, it's like, can can we get a bigger airdrop by using a product versus like, hey, this is a standard. Everybody will be using this standard. And so now what's the best product people can build for the standard? So I think like that's kind of the difference. I don't think it's as applicable to like this, you know, big commercial for-profit companies versus like this is an ecosystem that we're building um, and really defining more kind of this, I would say like, layers of the stack going back a bit to like this what you said about the switching cost from your telco for i guess like related here i guess one big thing in blockchain is generally like bridging or like if you want to switch the ecosystem you have to like go to some other chain and then like move the liquidity there which can be like cumbersome and you did mention the chain abstraction for a second there and i, I saw on your twitter a bunch also like this concept you have like of account aggregation uh, that you teased. So maybe you can, yeah, can you talk, tell us a bit about like what what are you doing there or, or how are you like sort of solving this interoperability problem in, in, in the blockchain space? For sure, yeah. So that that's a very important topic. So although we have started building bridges, I think, so the, our Rainbow Bridge been built from 2019. So we, I think we started building, you know, kind of in line with IBC, uh, <laughs> Uh, kind of timing, and we've been we've been running since um, I guess like beginning of twenty one, and at the same time, like bridges are really bad as a concept because they create a honeypot for security. They are the place to siphon off assets, uh, and, and like there's you know if there's any attack on the protocol itself, bridges kind of how you exit, uh, and. And they like the just the amount of failure modes between different blockchains is pretty like it's pretty big, right? But between multiple blockchains, it's like insane. Like, you know, chain stopped, blocks didn't publish, like all those things you need to like as a developer now you need to handle. And then on the application side, okay, you're, you're, you know, the fungible tokens transfers is maybe reasonable, but as soon as you add any logic, right, be that, you know, rebasing or be it NFT. Now, when you bridge it, you lose all of the logic on the other side. And so, so the concept I've been kind of exploring for a while now, I was calling it originally uh, remote accounts, but we, we kind of um, reframe it as account aggregation. This idea that ideally you want to have one account and there is mapped accounts to this ac on other chains. So imagine, you know, you have my root.near account on near. And then I have an address on Ethereum, I have an address on Bitcoin, I have an address on Solana, which I control with this account. And so now, if I want to buy a Solana NFT, right, by now I would need to like set up a new wallet, you know, bridge some stuff to Solana, buy the NFT, and then I like, I don't know, and then like go and look at it, you know, from time to time because I'm mostly sitting on here. Or you can, you have this Solana address that's linked to your, uh, to your near account, you pretty much through this buy an NFT for this address, and we can talk how that works. And now you have the front end that actually shows you everything you own across all of these chains from all of these addresses. And the way, the way mentally to think about it is when you go to Binance or Coinbase and you sign up with your Binance or Coinbase account, you have addresses on all chains, right? And I mean, they're, they are deposit addresses usually. But imagine those addresses were actually normal addresses you can use apps and buy NFTs and tokens, et cetera, with. So that and but your account is your, you know, Coinbase account. And so that's kind of where your, you know, like ownership is. And so that's what we're trying to like we building, and we're gonna be launching end of the first quarter, is this concept of account aggregation that now allows, together with decentralized front ends, allows to actually collapse the 
kind of this whole, you know, multiple chains, switching networks, you know, bridging, all of this into a very simple experience of you get an account, you know, you deposit some funds into it, and now you can transact across all blockchains, uh, across all of their apps, and it kind of will get executed on, on your behalf on those chains, and you have this addresses, but it's all self-custodial and all kind of hidden from you. You don't need to think about gas fees on those chains, etc. So that's kind of the experience we're going after. And again, this is just an extension of what we've been building with Near by trying to abstract out the Near blockchain. We're just like, okay, well, we can actually do that th the same thing for everyone and really provide like a unique and valuable experience because, you know, anything multi-chain you want to build, Near will be actually the place to build it because you will be able to transact across all of the chains without having to bridge, without having this like complexity. Uh, you want to build, for example, Bitcoin DeFi? Well, on near, you know, every near account or smart contract will have a Bitcoin address you can deposit to, it can start, you know, doing stuff, right? And so that's kind of conceptually what we uh, really bring into market with this and like kind of finishing our, I would say, arc of chain abstraction that we started with doing near in the first place. So on a on a high level, India, right? Like this idea is is in the Cosmos ecosystem. There's a chain called Neutron, and because the Cosmos ecosystem has IBC, so Cosmos chains can bridge to each other in quite a good way. Neutron has the idea that uh, in Cosmos you have the idea of delegated account control, which is like on one chain you have an address and that can control many other puppet addresses on other chains and Neutron is trying to build that kind of that, that puppet master chain where like you will have your central account and you will control other addresses on a lot of chains over IBC through Neutron. It feels similar. But the reason it works in the Cosmos ecosystem is you assume IBC that there's a secure bridging solution underneath available. For this to work in Neutron, my I almost start to think that, okay, the only way like this can work for Near and Solana, for example, having like a address on Near that can control a puppet address on Solana, you need a secure bridge between Near and Solana, is it not? So the bridging problem, solving the bridging problem seems like a prerequisite to this. Yeah, so we're trying to go away from bridging almost completely. I mean, there will be some places where you still need bridges, but um, so let, let's look at Bitcoin as just like a way more clean example, right? With Bitcoin, you cannot have a smart contract bridge because, well, Bitcoin still has smart contracts. And so the only thing you can do is to own addresses. And so the core idea here, and it's conceptually the same as yeah, what Neutron is doing, but the core idea is different. The core idea is we make near network itself be able to sign transactions for other blockchains. And so near network becomes... Uh, in the way custodian of all of this address, mapped addresses on all other chains. And you, as a near user telling network, right, be that through smart contract or, or, or user, user interaction, to sign a transaction on Bitcoin to send some Bitcoins from your remote address, from your delegated address to some other address, right? And so because of this, like, you don't need to actually bridge Bitcoin to near to do anything, right? You, you just literally... The Bitcoins live on Bitcoin network. The you know OP coins live on Optimism. The you know Solana and NFTs will live on Solana NFT uh, on Solana, and I just control all that uh, by just sending transactions there. But as a user, like I just interact with Near, and I kind of pay Near gas fee, which is very small. I say like do this, you know, I attach whatever. Also, you know, if I need to buy something, etc., on Near. And then we have kind of intent relayers that actually execute stuff. Like, you know, the transaction gets signed by near network and then intent relayer, you know, sends that transaction on your behalf on the other. And so there's no actual like bridging. There's no kind of security um, kind of issue where like if this bridge gets broken or whatever, or that network gets forked, et cetera, like none of that exists. And because near account, there's also like a very interesting and kind of a little bit crazy thing because near accounts are tra are actually tradable, so you can actually list near account as NFT, and somebody can buy it and get access to it because you can rotate keys on near. What this allows to do is you can have lots of assets across all kinds of networks, and then you can list that as a bundle 
on near as like you want to sell some drc 20s some solana nfts some ethereum nfts and some i don't know op coins and gmx at the same time you can list all that as a bundle under one near account and then somebody can buy all that with one transaction on near paying near transaction fee and within one second uh block time so you don't need to wait for bitcoin transfer you don't need to wait for all of this you can do it on one so you, you can actually start bundling all of these things and trading kind of across all chains on near very easily without actually sending transactions or bridging anything anywhere else and that's kind of the the shift that we're trying to do i call it unbridging that we like you have the account level kind of ownership that's maintained indeed but it's maintained by very specific security parameters that are near parameters and then if if the let's say Solana network fails for whatever reason, there's no bridge problems, right? That would you know uh, rise from from this, like because you own stuff on on Solana. So whatever Solana has to deal with, right? Like whenever it recovers, etc. Like you will get it back. But like it's it's kind of the same. Like you know you have this kind of relationship with that network, but not like there's no bridge that you need to deal with and kind of think of as like an intermediate, you know, complexity. So that's the idea. It's like, you know, again, we're going to be rolling out more documentation. Uh, it's like we have a testnet version coming out for people to hack on uh, in in kind of January. And so we, we actually invite people to start building because, again, like a multi-chain experiences, like you'll be able to build with this way easier uh, because you don't need to think about all of the complexity of like, oh, this message didn't deliver, the network is like paused you know, like something crashed because of inscriptions, like you don't need to deal with any of that, right? It's like, you can literally sell your, your you know, network failed. You can sell the account that ha that has assets in failed network, right? To somebody else, for example, if they want to take that risk, right? So like you can do that without having that network life uh, even. So so that's kind of the 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 level of experience we want by up. And like this leads to fully abstracting the blockchains, right? Because now from a user interface, I just go, I use the app, and like, I just see that I'm using my, for example, near account, and um, it doesn't really matter for me that that was a Solana like NFT that I bought, right? I just see it in my portfolio view, and like, you know, for that we need like indexing of Solana and all the other chains' data. So the same stack there. We need decentralized front ends that kind of aggregate all this, and so kind of that. That's like how we package all that stack into uh, by abstracting the blockchain. So quick, quick nerd question, which is. So, okay, so Nia is like, this is awesome, first of all. I mean, Nia becoming like a distributed custodian, essentially. Imagine it as like Coinbase, but distributed. And the distributed custodian can have hot wallets, basically, on all of the other uh, all of the other chains. But as an engineer, my, my, my question really starts to be in, in Bitcoin, you have like a single SIG account or a multi-SIG account. That's what Bitcoin provides available, right? Like it, it assumes that there is like maybe like one private key and then one public key and there's a signature to that public key. Whereas Nia as a distributed network has lots of validators. So how do, what fancy cryptography makes this, makes this work? Yeah, so it's called chain signature. And so this is a threshold signature with uh, where the val as validators rotate, you can maintain actually the same set of public keys. So even though you rotate and like have different parts of the private key uh, being rotated, they all, like when they sign threshold signature, you get the same public key. And I mean, you can have derivations of this, so you can have like as many public keys as possible, but they all deterministic within the whole blockchain. So, so that's a pretty cool technology. Um, and yeah, like it's kind of reasonably new. Some of the folks from Decidu been pioneering that, and uh, yeah, we're kind of leveraging that as a way to have near to become this this decentralized kind of custodian. Right. I think maybe also Axelar works a little bit like that, or am I, I? I think. But anyway, one question that I had, like in this scenario where you have. The you buy the NFT on Solana, you need the liquidity right on Solana as a user. So maybe I have like funds on Near, but I don't have on Solana. Like, is there some system that you're thinking of to to balance that out without bridging or yeah? 
Exactly. Yeah. So we so this is where we call them intent relayers, or I mean, we'll, we'll, we're still shopping the name. But so this is the idea that on near we have this. Um, well, we have this principle of trial account. So this idea where I can send you right now a link. You click on it, and you'll have some near in it, so you can do stuff on near, but you cannot withdraw that near. So we actually like we kind of like uh, what what it will do is like actually send you a one-time use private key, which when you click, it actually create a new private key in your in on your browser, switch that private key, but that private key is limited access to that account, so you can transact, but you cannot withdraw funds. And so that kind of concept applied now to other uh, kind of chains in a way. A lot, what it allows to do is we can have other parties to, to fund the account uh, to execute things, right? They can put some Solana tokens to pay for gas or for NFTs, but you cannot withdraw that by sending a tra like direct transaction to withdraw Solana. So, so what this allows now to do is you can pay the somebody on near with near token, and then they will put Solana tokens there and then execute your transaction. And kind of by doing that, right, we kind of have pretty much a way to. That's why I say it's intent, right? You say like my intent is to buy some Solana thing, but I don't have Solana token. Like here's a bunch of near tokens, execute that there. And so, and you know, now you need somebody who has liquidity on all the chains to execute the stuff. But that's like having a third parties doing that is way easier, right? Than to have like whole bridging and automatic uh, execution. So this is like, yeah, really like um, some sort of fee attached to it, and the relayer can grab it. It's not like a blockchain network or anything. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's like a third party. Yeah, like you know. Like a market maker or whatever, whoever it is. Yeah. It's like yeah, any market maker or any like a, a, a like bot arbitrage bots can do this kind of stuff pretty much. And 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 they also as doing that, they'll just relay the transaction as well. So like you don't need to actually also send the, like submit transaction because like the validator is only sign transaction right now. Somebody needs to like actually ship it to peer to peer network. So they they will do that as well. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, like looking forward to reading more about it once. The, the more documentation is there and stuff. But yeah, thanks for, for sharing it here. And um, yeah, I guess further in the near journey, like we, we didn't actually talk about much about the chain itself, right? I think um, you were basically one of the first, if not the first, like sort of sharded blockchains and um, and been like staying with that sort of narrative while I think, yeah, others have pivoted from that. Um, so yeah. Can you tell us a bit, like, how has the, like, near sharding developed or what, what is sharding actually, again, for people that forgot about it? <laughs> uh, and, you know, where, where, where is it going? Yeah, so as I mentioned, right, my co-founder, Alex, who was, you know, building sharded database. I mean, I'm coming from Google where everything is sharded, just like you cannot have, you know, billion users and put them into one database. It just doesn't work. And so, and like on my computer. And so for us, it was like, you know, kind of pretty obvious that you need sharding. And so sharding, I mean, at, at the core, the idea is like you, as you process, you know, as, as you store more data, as you process more transactions, you need m multiple machines doing work in parallel. And you want these machines to be kind of doing similar work, right? And like distributing load. And ideally, as more load comes in, you actually increase number of computers, right? So this is how all of the Web2 giants work. You know, again, Imagine your Gmail, right? Or imagine uh, Facebook, right? There's like a database underneath, which, you know, is sharded. It has hundreds or thousands of servers that store, for example, user data. And, uh, you know, when your user requesting, it routes you to the server where your user data is and retrieves it. And then when you need to update something or process, you know, transaction, it kind of routes that transaction there. So that's kind of the core concept. And like, you know, again, logically, you cannot have... Like, you cannot have billions of users using the same, like, one server, right? And this is what's currently happening where for non-sharded systems, it means, like, they're relying on pretty much one server replicated, but one server, nevertheless, to process everything that happens on their chain. And so, so for us, it was kind of, you know, pretty obvious that we need to do this now. Blockchain adds extra complexity compared to Web2, where you have all of the you know, security that you need to deal with. 
And so um, we've been kind of obviously iterating on on a design kind of within this conceptual thing. And so we introduced Nightshade uh, back in 2019, which was our sharding design, where in a way every single near contract or account is actually a separate chain. And we just bundle them in such a way such that as users and developers, you don't know about it, right? Uh, and so we kind of bundle them to the number of machines that, you know, parallel processing machines at a time you need to. And so, again, this is very similar how Web2 works, where, you know, every, like, user account is, in a way, independent and they store and they can be, like, moved around between different databases, like, between different computers uh, in the database. And so, so this kind of allows to abstract out the complexity of the sharding from the user, right? As a user, if you go to near blockchain, you will not see shards. We don't actually show them. Like you need to go to RPC and like query the block headers and stuff like this. Um, now, the thing that we in 19 were planning to do was uh, for security was based on challenges. And that's proved to be very challenging. And this is across the whole space, right? We've seen like a number of other chains actually struggling with implementing challenges. And so kind of earlier this year, we ended up uh, kind of doing research and, and refocusing on instead doing stateless validation. So what this means is now when block is produced, uh, block actually contains all of the state that, that, uh, execute, that transactions touched and that information is being sent around to everybody else. What this means is that other validators don't need to have state of the shard. They can just validate the block on its own. And it means we can have, you know, hundreds and thousands of validators validating every shard. It can be completely random. They don't need to be assigned to a specific shard at any time. And uh, this also means we can, you know, have now a lot more kind of nodes and validators in the network kind of proving the whole system. Now, kind of on a low level, what it, what NIR is, is really a decentralized sh shared sequencer that then sends out the data availability of these transactions across the whole chain. We use erasure coding. And then we have this execution, which now is stateless execution, which then is being proven by a number of other validators and, and settled. Right, so we kind of package the whole what now is modular framework, actually in one you know pipeline way on top of the same set of validators, right? Kind of just being rotated constantly across the network, and so that's uh, you know at the core what near is, and so we actually are going to be launching the new uh, testing network for stateless validation uh, to kind of as a part of our phase two launch. And so this is kind of finalizes like core roadmap of, of sharding that we've outlined since 2019. And uh, this should be coming kind of January or February. And we're going to have, you know, the full mainnet launch probably in April. And this is the idea that actually kind of conceptually, if people read like Vitalik's Endgame, this is in the way that structure. You have block producers, who are sharded, who are kind of can, you know, we can keep adding more block producers in parallel so you can keep scaling the network. Uh, we're also moving the uh, kind of a somewhat in because of this block producers now don't need to rotate as much. We're actually moving the whole state into memory, which gives us about 10x improvement on each shard's uh, kind of transaction processing. Uh, and so like each shard gets 10 X and then you can have more shards. And so then they per kind of, you know, they do where's your coding data availability and then they do processing, create this, uh, blocks with state witnesses, send them out. And then you have large network of validators who, who don't need to be this large, who can just uh, validate these blocks without having the full state of the chain. So that, that's kind of the, you know, in a way, finalizing our roadmap, but also very much the end game. It kind of bundles a lot of the current, like, roll-up concepts and, you know, sells a base concept that Ethereum is talking about into one product. And then uh, we announced we we working on ZK Vlasm with Polygon because this kind of this sending out state witness with the block is actually 
uh, a lot of bandwidth. And what ZK Wasm allows us to do is actually to prove the whole block execution with state witness on the block producer directly. And so now instead of sending like potentially, you know, megabyte of data, we can just send, you know, whatever 10 kilobyte proof uh, out and everybody else can just validate that without re-executing all the same transactions. So that is kind of actually, you know, final end game. I mean, there's like a few more pieces that uh, to complete the picture, but that is the structure that we, we think is pretty much final kind of architecture that, uh, you know, you have censorship resistant, uh, shared sharded sequencer, right? So, uh, and you can, you know, you have like all the data availability underneath to pr provide you so that, and like we do data availability first before execution, because that means all the other indexers and other pieces of infrastructure can start executing in parallel. And so you don't have latency on user interfaces before the kind of finalization of the execution on the validators themselves. Then you have kind of execution on validators, send out witness, and now, uh, you know, lo large network of validators can validate it and prove it without needing to have state rotated and all kind of having like, you know, potentially state is like 50 gigabytes, for example. So they don't need to like have that 50 gigabytes on them. They just receive whatever relevant for the transactions that being processed. And so that's kind of the, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit complicated as a, as a scheme, but, but like really it's powering this again, like the kind of the end game structure, uh, that, uh, people have been talking about and at the same time, it's, it is like kind of that modularity, just like reusing the same set of servers, right. To, to ensure kind of, uh, throughput and, uh, latency, low latency. Yeah, like that's that's like an episode on its own. To be honest, to dig through that, is it correct to think that like the stateless validation requires zk wasm as a primitive? So no, because you you can do stateless validation without zk. So what you do is you execute transactions, you record which pieces of state you touched, and then you just send those pieces of state with with witnesses, right? With uh, kind of uh, proof that it's part of the state together with transactions. And so we're actually launching that first while in parallel kind of working on ZK Wasm. And so ZK Wasm, what it allows to do though, is just compress all of these and execution of and validation of this into just a proof, right? So in a way, like ZK Wasm will prove the execution of this blob, pretty much state plus transactions into just a fixed size proof. But it, but it, so it's more of an optimization. ZK Wasm from this perspective is optimization. And it's obviously like way better for like longer term, you know, storage, but it's not a prerequisite. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll try to present my simple imagination of like, of this system. So the way I imagine it is like, if you imagine I'm a, I'm a validator, I'm an accountant, right? Automated accountant. Essentially in near, I have the capability, I'm assigned somehow like some piece of work and the, and somehow my work is also rotating, right? Like it's not part, there's a massive ledger, massive ledger, massive state. And I am assigned, hey, go and make some changes to this part of, of the state. So I can, I can basically go to that part of the state. There are a bunch of transactions associated with it. I execute the transactions and first I can I make the data available. Hey, these are the transactions I am I'm going to execute. I make the execution, I update the state, and today I somehow provide some witnesses so that for the other accountants I can sort of provide a proof. Hey, I did my job correctly. Here's proof. And they don't need to download my part of the state to verify my work. And this ZK proof will make that even easier. So the state, imagine as a massive, massive tree or something, I can, I can modify some branches of the tree and I create a proof. And then I, that proof is witnesses today, ZK wasn't tomorrow. And I can send that thing to others. They don't actually need to have my part of the tree in order to verify my work. And, um, and then there's a separate system that says, okay, in modifying this part of the tree, what are the transactions I did? Uh, some somebody uh, duplicates duplicates that work, 
and because because i can modify a part of the tree quite independently and there are many like me um so there are many accountants like me all of these accountants are kind of modifying like different parts of the tree uh in parallel and like that is fundamentally why the system is able to scale yeah very well put so you have partnership with eigen da why do you need a partnership with eigen da in that case yeah so so this kind of maybe yeah ch- changing gears right so so this is like near itself this is near itself right like it has no interaction with other things but yeah yeah so so and and again near itself right now is you know top used blockchain by number of addresses for example uh you know daily active monthly active weekly active and so like near itself has like a bunch of utility and and value already but again we kind of when we frame this like chain abstraction thesis right what it means is that for the developers and users on top we try to provide as smooth experience across using other chains as well and this is where we kind of looked around and like oh near already has data availability built in uh like that's just part of our protocol and so we have you know a bunch of layer 2s that we can plug in into this to uh kind of hook in into the rest of our systems right and so that's where we kind of you know started uh and in like kind of pretty much pr- provided a way to hook in up stack cdk uh uh starknets kind of stacks how do you publish your data on near now if you just publish data on near it's useful it you know it's obviously very cheap it's you know way cheap like cheaper than uh pretty much everything else in the market and because near is sharded you actually have more capacity than anything else can, that can take your data already and we're going to add more shards but it's not as useful because you cannot route messages between um between kind of smart contracts on rollups between each other and near in near contracts and so that's where we had a partnership with eigen layer not eigen da to uh help us actually um do the work for this layer 2s to get, get to executed state and uh, outgoing messages such that the uh applications that want to route messages faster within 1 or 2 second they can actually do that through the near network so eigen layer validators will execute this rollup given the data published on near they'll execute it and they will have a new state route for the rollup itself now so think of it it's it will be extra accountants ethereum accountants who will be actually looking at the rollups um and updating state route there but then publishing back to the near like telling it to a near accountants as well and so now near accountants and ethereum accounts together know the state of both near and all of the rollups that are plugged into the system and so now you can route messages between rollup contracts and near contracts and you know back and forth And so this allows us to kind of again like align more the 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 space of of the uh the space and so again for chain abstraction for account aggregation it means we can do things way faster between all of the rollups that that fit into the system. So that's kind of how like DA plus eigen layer kind of provide this fast finality. And then, you know, there's other kind of tooling that we, you know, plug in on top with decentralized front ends to really kind of abstract it from a user. but like we need that kind of alignment again need near in the way each account like each each element of that tree is is separate roll up right and we kind of we have a system for managing them and so we kind of trying to fit the other roll ups into the same system and you know obviously we need to like plug in some pieces to to make it work under the same security parameters that roll up expect right which is ethereum security hence the eigen layer and then da is kind of a way to get this data you know into the system as well and and provide some guarantees there um hard to unpack but but or like logically it's like yeah imagine yeah it is exactly that is imagine near as this massive tree and then there are like lo- lots of accountants in near itself there's one group of accountants and then accountants can kind of modify parts of the tree independent of each other 
They can send proofs about their modifications so that other other accountants can trust their work. And then kind of like this eigenlayer partnership is in some way saying that there is CDM accountants here. Yeah, it's like Nia, Nia says, we have an awesome group of accountants, but if you want your own accountants and if you want your own roll-up, you have created a separate group of accountants, but then your accountants and the near accountants, we we sort of need to interface in some way so that, um, so that the work your accountants did can be deduplicated on near and the other way around. And via this deduplication, we can somehow achieve like trustless interactions between Ethereum rollups and Near, so something like that, right? Yeah, pretty much. Like, I would say the so rollups is pretty much I want my own accountant, right? That runs everything, but then I I trust Ethereum accountants to revalidate everything and and finalize it, right? So like Ethereum accountants are, are fi the final, final, my accountant is the one who can do quickly, right? He sits right by my side. And so what we say here is near accountants can, you know, can provide a bunch of value by, you know, either connecting your accountant to the other guy's accountant, right? So you can connect together or to our applications, but you st we still need Ethereum accountants because the finality of the rollups is on Ethereum. Right, and so that's why we have Eigenlayer pretty much to lend us their <laughs> Ethereum accountants uh, to kind of use the let the you know as a rollup publishes the ledger right from their accountant first. Like we have Ethereum, you know, accountants for Eigenlayer to like, validate everything quickly, right before the full Ethereum finality will happen, and so that allows to kind of near accountants and to have like trust into into the execution of what happened on the rollup while also have the way quicker you know time to finality and to communication of messages for these rollups and maintaining the same security as as they have through ethereum so that's kind of like you know it's like rollups near and ethereum coming all together into like one happy family of accountants i think that's that's a great note to end on right like a uh, big happy family of accountants <laughs> Um, yeah, Ilya, thank you so much for coming on. It's been like a massive episode. I think, um, yeah, uh, I need to like process this and I'm, I'm sure our listeners will take some time to process everything too. Well, we can do it another one <laughs> in a few months <laughs> as we launch all this stuff. So yeah, totally. And yeah, we still also have Alex episode about the uh, smarter LLMs uh, outstanding. So, uh, lots to do. But yeah, thanks so much for coming on and, and thanks for our, to our listeners. To, we'll have like one and a half hours of, of content here. Thanks, guys.